Tin, thank you very much indeed for uh, indicating a number of challenges that you are facing in Copenhagen, and some of them are very similar to the ones we are facing in the UK, but there are, I think, a number there that perhaps we're not even facing up to at all, so that gives us very much food for thought. But our second speaker is John Hocking. John is currently um, the director of the Joseph Rowntree Housing Trust. He was appointed there in 2009, um, overseeing responsible for operational work of uh, GRHT, um, and previously he had a, a long career in um, various uh, local authorities and other housing organisations. He was, uh, just prior to that, um, the Director of Housing at Hull City Council um, and has worked in a variety of diverse places, uh, Southwark, Leeds and York, uh, as a housing officer. And John reminded me before we started that he used to work in Sheffield when uh, I was around on the council some years ago. I think you also pointed out, John, that uh, most of the areas you used to manage at that time have now been demolished. So I don't know whether you or I are responsible for that, but uh, we look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Yes, if I turn up in your street, move. Right. Um, the Joseph Rantry Foundation and the Joseph Rantry Housing Trust were two charities, same trustees, same strategic aims. Our organisation was founded by Joseph Rantry with a very clear aim of searching out the root causes of poverty and tackling them. So, in answering the question, where will our grandchildren live? I think we would start from the premise um, that our grandchildren can, if we wish, uh, live in a UK that's free of poverty. Poverty is real, but it's not inevitable. We have the resources and the ability uh, to make the UK a poverty-free country. And by doing that, we all benefit. Uh, poverty wastes people's potential, it drains, drains public finances, and it hampers economic growth. And when Joseph was looking at the report that his son Seaborn did on poverty in York, his response to that report was to buy some land from Lord Halifax, just north of where the chocolate factory was, in York and start building houses. And his aim, uh, having commissioned Parker and Unwin to do the design for the master plan, we were then the forerunners for Letchworth and the Garden City movement. His aim, um, he sought to create a self-sustaining village community which was to have nothing charitable about it, where tenants would pay rents which would give a practical return and houses were to be well-built, convenient, healthy, artistic in design, having gardens, and each garden had an apple and pear tree, and I still get complaints now about what to do with them. Why are they, why are they littering at the end of the garden? And really important that they were to be let at a rental within the means of a labourer or a clerk, i.e. affordable. Hundred years later, I think our main challenge is we can't do that anymore. Joseph understood that people needed to live not just on the best necessities, but that poverty itself uh, was about experience. It was about the ability to be part of society um, and that, that Socialisation was important, being able to buy a birthday present was important. And each year at Joseph Rantry we produce uh, work around the minimum income standard, which is what a panel of the general public think are the, is the basic minimum standard, what they, can, what they buy, what they uh, use to travel, etc. And we then track how, that, how people uh, uh, how, can, can achieve the minimum income standard and, and what happens as the economy changes. And what we've seen over the last five years, since 2008, is that affordability uh, has diminished. That when you look at housing affordability, it isn't just about the rent, it's not just about what the 
the price is if you're buying it's about how much it is to heat it's how far it is it's away from work where's the childcare and it's about sourcing local food etc and if you look at the impact on uh, family and minimum income standards over since 2008 you see rents increased by 32% energy 45% Bus is 37%, childcare 42 and food 26 Average incomes have increased by 9%. People are getting poorer. And that's playing out across the political debates that are taking place. But what that's actually doing, and Clive mentioned the issue about housing benefits, £24 billion being spent on housing benefit. And that isn't about benefit taking the strain. The people who take the strain on benefits are the people who are having to claim it and that money of course is going either to people like me as a social landlord or to the private sector landlord. And it's trapping people within that benefit dependency and a system which is becoming increasingly draconian. We've got to a position where we've lost the link between housing costs and the income. That link's now broken. And it's been mentioned what affordability is in Yorkshire. That was published by the National Housing Federation yesterday. Seven times the income. In York, we're looking at people having to earn 40,000 a year to afford the Orwellianly described affordable rent which is linked to market 80% of market value and in London where my kids are at the moment kids they're in their 20s sorry they you're looking at 70 to 100,000 that's not affordable we've looked at what the response of social housing uh, providers is to this to this crisis and it's it's fascinating we looked at the business plans of, of landlords both private and in, in the social housing sector and what we've seen is a split almost a 50 50 split some are being driven by their business plans to I suppose maximize their rental income get into intermediate housing products those 80 percent of market values letting homes to a totally different client group and letting fewer homes to those most in need. 50% are going back to their roots, asking why they were set up in the first place and trying to keep rents down. But that's a very difficult place to be. You've also got local authorities who are now just desperately trying to reduce the cost of housing benefit in their area and looking to there's quite a lot of conflict around the impact of affordable rents within areas. And I suppose the question that we have to ask is, are our business plans in the social housing industry in danger of delivering unaffordable housing, which traps increasing numbers of working households in, punitive, in a punitive benefit system? It's a long way from the Garden City principles where we started when Joseph Rantree built New Earswick. But I think there's a clue to what we can do in the future in here. The idea of community ownership and land and long-term stewardship and capturing the value. We know the economic model works when you look at Milton Keynes, at Letchworth, etc. That you can build affordable housing which you link to local average earnings. And we're working at the moment on trying to get a model which will do that, that housing associations and local authorities could use. You need that high quality imaginative design. It needs to be close to local strong job offers. Generous green space, access to local culture and recreation, the integrated transport that makes it easy to get to work. There was a, an article a couple of weeks ago in the paper about the Chief Exec of London Transport being extremely concerned about the social consequences of, of, of people who are on low incomes being moved out of the centre of London because of the benefit cap and then having to pay high fares to get into work. It becomes unsustainable and it starts to create conflict within the city. 
And the idea, going back to where Joseph was, of local food sourcing, including allotments. And we also need to look at those principles of, simple principles of designing good homes, of space, of, lifetime, of, of providing for lifetime homes, where you can adapt and there's flexibility, where there's sustainability in both the carbon footprint and affordability in heating bills, where they're connected easily to the rest of the city or town and flexibility um, in terms of master planning. This is uh, New Earswick in York. Um, not an easy photograph to see, but that's what it looks like. It's not particularly spectacular, isn't it? What worries me is I still get people coming to see New Earswick to find out how to do proper design 100 years after it was set out. This is Derwenthorpe. This is the, if you like, our successor uh, to, to New Earswick. Um, it was built, uh, it's being built, sorry, by uh, David Wilson Holmes, part of the Barrett Group. It was designed by Richard Partington. Um, it's designed to be tenure blind. It's pepper potting, so you'll get a rented by an owner, by a shared owner and you won't be able to tell as you walk round which is which. It didn't stop people buying homes in the area, despite the predictions. 40% um, of the homes are affordable. We've got a communal heating system, uh, which is biomass boilers, which is a scary thing to put in, I can tell you, and you get very obsessed with um, the size of the wood pellets. But as a product, what it's doing is, re together with high performance uh, within the design of the homes, we're seeing energy bills. Well, I was at a meeting last night with tenants, and they were telling me they, uh, their bill for um, September was £18 a month. That's a significant saving. And it, it's selling. So people are moving on to the estate, seeing it as 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 somewhere they really want to live. In terms of how we finance that, that's built with a £49,000 average grant. And from the work we've done, I don't know how you provide the quality that is needed without providing that grant funding. It took us 12 years to get this on site. Um, it was called by one of the residents on the, uh, on the estate that's adjoining this, as this was the abomination. It isn't a 30 semi. They didn't like the design. Inside, they're beautiful. But 12 years, 5.6 million before we even got on site, and 2 million of that was just wasted in legal challenges against objections. And all that's doing is taking the money out of the system and reducing the number of new homes that we can provide. But as a product, it's selling. The next question for me was, and where are our grandparents going to live? Um, this is a scheme we're developing in New Earswick. It's um, predominantly for, for, for older people, but we're looking at uh, a, a, a residential housing which is integrated with the community, not separate to it. It is based around a registered care facility. It, ha it will be linked to a domiciliary service. It's linked to uh, a folk hall, which you can see over in the corner, which is the main hub of the village. It has a restaurant. It has activity on every night. Um, it has a theater. We've got play spaces in amongst the uh, uh, the, the retirement apartments. It's, a re, it's going to be a thriving retirement village, but one in which the rest of the community um, can come in and enjoy. And I suppose the other question for me is, and where are our grandchildren going to live? We've been doing a lot of work in looking at climate change and the impact that climate change will have, uh, particularly on, on low-income groups. And I know this is quite difficult to see, but where your grandchildren aren't going to be living, 
is the red area, which is most of Yorkshire, from Hull out up to uh, Rotherham, is the area where it, you're going to get the most incidences flooding and where the communities are least prepared, the least able to, to, to adapt and change to that circumstance. Climate change is, is real and it's clearly happening, but insurance companies are now using these maps when they're doing insurance uh, assessments. Um, Clive mentioned that I was Director of Housing at Hull. Uh, while I was there, um, 6,000 homes were flooded in the space of 20 minutes when the water table rose. The water had nowhere to go, came straight off the chalk downs, came up to the Humber and just uh, inundated the homes. Um, that will happen more often. Um, and we have a responsibility now as to how we're going to tackle that burden that our grandchildren are going to face in the future. Thank you. Thank you.